What's going on, everybody? Welcome back for another episode of Shooting It Straight with myself, Justin Jackson, uh, and my man, John. Um, coming back for another installment. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Johnny T-Shirt, uh, the place to, to go for any apparel needs when it comes to UNC. And then also Congruity HR, where Tar Heel fans can get a free payroll and HR needs assessment. So shout out to them for sponsoring um, this episode and all the other episodes involved. So, um, but John, man, it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting, interesting time right now. Uh, I guess moving forward, you got one more game of regular season ACC play. Uh, you got the ACC tournament and then see where the, you know, where Joe Lenardi and the, you know, bracketology committee, uh, tournament committee decides to put them and what seed to put them at. But uh, obviously, you know, you can't, you can't go over any kind of ACC win. Obviously last, uh, you know, last game, North Carolina won 84 to 51 against, uh, I think just a less talented Notre Dame team. Obviously they're 12 and 18, seven and 12 in conference. So, you know, they, uh, you know, I think they're just less talented, have a little bit, you know, not as many good players as North Carolina does. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think there's some takeaways that you can that you can definitely have even in a game like that where it's a blowout. You know, first and foremost, I think we should definitely take time to kind of talk about, you know, it was senior night and uh, kind of talk about what that kind of means um, and, and what this class of seniors mean. For me, I never got a chance to uh, do a senior night because I left a year too early. But you know, obviously seeing people over the years and the speeches that the seniors give and all that kind of stuff and letting, you know, the the big thing with Coach Williams and obviously Coach Davis does the same thing now too is starting all the seniors as opposed to, you know, the normal starting five that they always have. And so for me, seeing those, seeing those kind of things are always so cool to me. Um, you know, a lot of times it's the walk-ons and guys like that that don't really get a chance to to play on a consistent basis. So they just kind of get beat up on in practice and then got to go and cheer on, you know, cheer on the main guys. So to see them be able to go out there and play a little bit and, you know, looking at the, looking at the box score, Lebo got four shots up in four minutes. So I, uh, you know, I respect, I respect guys, you know, they, they take advantage of, uh, you know, of their opportunity from that standpoint. Um, but John, you were you were there at the at the at the Dean Dome, man. What did you? What was the atmosphere like? What was it? Uh, you know, what were some things that, that kind of caught your eye? Yeah, I was up in the uh, upper deck. My seats aren't as good as yours, uh, Justin. But <laughs> it was a really special night in the Smith Center, as you know, Justin, being a part of the team. Obviously, you know, playing at Carolina for all those years. Um, you know, the Carolina family is really special, and there's certain moments when the kind of curtain gets lifted a little bit and fans, media, everyone at the Smith Center on certain nights gets to sort of feel like they're part of that family experience as well. And I think that was really playing out last night with Armando and, and RJ, you know, potentially not RJ's senior night, but he went through the ceremonies. There were just so many little moments uh, that happened throughout the course of the game. Um, you know, Armando shooting two three-pointers and then Roy Williams standing in his little corner section <laughs> and kind of giving a little shrug, uh, you know, acknowledging that maybe, you know, Armando wasn't always shooting uh, as much when Roy was around. But, hey, Armando went and he hit the shots. He made two three-pointers. So you have to give him credit there. Um, and a lot of emotional moments, too. I mean, the standing ovation that Armando got, that RJ got, that all the guys got as they were walking off the floor and, and the big hug from Hubert Davis really stands out to me. Uh, also, after the game was done, Roy Williams came down in the tunnel uh, and he gave a huge hug to Armando and, and to RJ as well. Um, so just one of those nights that, you know, it, it kind of represents Carolina basketball in, in so many different ways. And um, I think a game that wasn't necessarily memorable on the court, but everything that happened off the court made it a really special night. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I went through, I guess, three years of having senior nights. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the one of the coolest things for me 
is kind of the response from the fans when it comes to the seniors. No matter really what impact on the floor the players necessarily had, um, just the reactions from the fans and the, the energy and the, the way that the atmosphere is on senior night is just – it's a pretty dope experience, you know, and obviously it's always better too whenever you uh, – when you're going into a game and you win by 30 on senior night. That obviously makes it way better too. But, you know, to see – you know, to see Mondo get a standing ovation, obviously everything he's done for this program, all the records that he holds and has broken and is continuing to break, you know, and then obviously RJ, you know, with what he's done without – you know, throughout his career, but then what he's done this year is just – you know, it's, it's, it needs to be appreciated. You know, you don't, you don't get many opportunities to kind of see guys have seasons like RJ's having, or to see guys break records like Mondo has broken, you know, like those records that are up there. You look at the names that were in there. I mean, there's Ralph Sampson, there's Tim Duncan. That's 20, 30 years ago that these records have been standing. So, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely an appreciation that should be there. You know, I think looking into the actual game itself, it's hard to it's hard to really hold much of the numbers and much of the stats and things like that to a high regard because of the talent level of this Notre Dame team. They were just less talented than than North Carolina is. And so it's tough. You know, you look at you look at somebody like Jalen Washington, who was four for five, two for two from three, you know, five rebounds. You know, you look at you kind of look at that and it's like, you know, and then I even went, I even looked, you know, kind of at what his season stats are. And he's only averaging eight minutes, you know, eight minutes a game, you know, for 30 games or whatever. But you look at his numbers and it's like 68 from the field and like 57 or something like that from three. And, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to look at the stats and look at games like this and say, oh, you know, this guy should have more opportunity and this guy should, you know, be in these situations more often. But if if we're being realistic, the, the team, the, the competition level just isn't what it's going to – it's not what it is going to be going forward, going through the ACC tournament. Obviously, can't forget about the Duke game before that. But then going into the NCAA tournament, you're not going to see any teams like Notre Dame. Um, and so, you know, I think there's there's little things. Cormac Ryan shot the ball well, you know, even coming off the bench and, you know, playing in that different role. Seth, I thought – played really well but Seth was really solid on both ends of the floor which is kind of what he's been for the majority of the season um you know obviously Harrison he does this thing rebounding I think you know from the start of the season I said Harrison was the x factor right I said that he was the guy that this team um if this team is going to make it to where I think they can make it he has to be really really good for them and you know, when I look at going down the stretch, and I was actually just talking to uh, Theo about it too, Harrison is going to have to be really good going forward, especially shooting the ball and being aggressive from that side of things to open things up more for RJ and Mondo. Because as now as you get into tournament play, it's one game or you go home. And so every, if I had to guess, every team that they go against – they're going to try everything they can to try to get the ball out of RJ's hands. They're going to try everything they can if Mondo gets on the block to double him, get it out of his his hands. So then that leaves Cormac and Harrison mainly as the two guys that are going to be outside either shooting the ball, making plays off of closeouts or whatever that looks like. Um, and so I think Harrison, you know, going into this stretch of games, I think is going to, you know, it's going to be big for him to step up and be big, you know, kind of how he's been all year, but, even to another level. To win a championship, everybody has to chip in. Everybody has to play well and play to their best ability. You know, a lot of times, you know, it just takes one or two guys to have an off night, unfortunately, in the tournament for a team to be able to slip up and and knock you out. So, um, you know, when I look at Harrison, obviously, five for 16, it's a different type of vibe because it's senior night. You're coming off the bench and things like that. But five for 16 is going to be tough, you know, going forward for – this team to be as good as they can. And so, but I think their biggest thing that they've, you know, they've really hung their hat on is the defensive side of things. You look at some of the runs that they made, 16-0 run to start the second half. I think at the end of the game, they finished with like an 18-0 run. 
Um, and so, you know, once again, it's all a matter of perspective because Notre Dame is, you know, not the most talented team once again, but they did exactly what they were supposed to do to a team that was not as talented as them. And, you know, I think as, as, you know, they go into this next game and Duke and go forward, I think that's going to be big for them is to continue that defensive, you know, dominance that they've had all year while also really continue to click offensively and find things that work offensively. So I'm excited, I'm excited, man. I think this was honestly a perfect game to kind of set up going into the last game of the season. I feel like, you know, not necessarily because it was a blowout and it was, you know, a game where everybody could get involved and get touches and things like that. But, you know, now they can go into, you know, these next few days, get some rest, start to really look in on, okay, what's our mindset going into Cameron against Duke and go in there fresh as possible. Obviously at this point in the season, nobody's really a hundred percent. That's just the way sports work, but you can be as fresh as possible going into this game now because of, you know, how minutes we're able to be, you know, divvied up in this Notre Dame game and things like that. So I'm excited going forward, man. I like what you said too about Harrison and his role being really important at this time of year. Kind of takes me back to Brady Manick during that 2022 final four run. He was good all year, but he was really important during March Madness. I'm looking at his stats right now. Uh, He had 28 points against Marquette in the first game. 26 points against Baylor, and there were plenty of shots for him all March Madness long against UCLA in the Sweet 16. He took 10 three-pointers. So that shows you, as you're saying, everything tightens up. If you have that open shot and you're in the corner, uh, Harrison kind of sometimes likes to look at the ball a little bit for a second, but he's got to (laughs) have confidence to shoot that open shot. And I like what you said, too, about the, uh, the runs that UNC went on. I think that's another really good sign. Uh, for me, as UNC heads into March Madness, uh, one of these advanced stats sites, uh, Evan Maya or uh, Mia, I think it's pronounced, he tracks these stats called kill shots, which are essentially 10 0 or greater runs. Um, and UNC has had 26 of those so far this season. They had a few against Notre Dame as well. Um, that's number one in the ACC, and they've only given up seven. Uh, throughout the entire season. So I think that speaks to the strength of UNC's team. And in March, sometimes you have to put teams away or, you know, game can change on just a quick little run like that, a a few threes here and there, a fast break, all of a sudden it's a 10-0 run and you have all the momentum. So I think seeing UNC put Notre Dame away early with some big runs and really come out and dominate the second half as well with that 16-0 run, as you referenced, that's another kind of positive sign for me heading into March Madness. Yeah, and I think the bigger, obviously twenty. What did you say? Twenty six. They've had twenty six mm-hmm. of those, you know, quote unquote, mm-hmm. kill shots. I think the bigger number for me is that they've only allowed seven of them against them. Mm-hmm. You know, so for me, that shows uh, for one resilience. That shows that when teams do start to get, you know, get going and go on a little bit of a run, they're able to kind of lock it back in and stop the momentum that they've had on a consistent basis. But two, I think going. Going back to what you were talking about with Harrison and Brady, it's funny you say that because that's exactly the the comparison that me and Theo were talking about. The thing with basketball is you always have to give up something. That's just how it works, you know? So when you go against a team like this North Carolina team, you're not going to give up open shots to RJ. You're not going to give one-on-one situations on the block with Mondo. Um, You're not going to give just one-on-one isolation situations with Elliott necessarily, especially with how he's – he kind of looks like he's getting more and more comfortable and kind of figuring out his spots and where to be aggressive and things like that. So a lot of times, let's say, for instance, if they start going to the post and they're doubling, then a lot of times you're giving up open looks outside because you just don't want to give that up. So, and I think the biggest thing with Brady was Brady, there was no hesitation with Brady. There was none. Obviously he was, I would say more of a, you know, he was titled as more of a shooter than Harrison is. Um, but Harrison's also shown that he can shoot the ball pretty consistently throughout this year. And so what I'm looking for going forward is can Harrison step into these shots confidently, no hesitation, knowing that, Hey, this is the best shot for our team in this certain possession. You know, I think a lot of times guys think that, Hey, if I, if I get it, I need to do more than me just catch and shoot 
or me just taking whatever is easiest when a lot of times that's the best thing you're going to get for the, for that possession. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's going to be big, you know, and at the same time, I think Cormac is going to be right there with them too. You know, those are two guys, like I said, they're going to have to give something up and more than likely it's going to be outside shooting. Uh, and it's going to come from those two guys because they're not going to give up RJ, you know, on a consistent basis being open. And so, I'm I'm very excited and very interested to see how they handle kind of that uh, responsibility, I guess I would call it, not even pressure. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they can do it. And Harrison's shown and uh, Cormac's shown it a couple games too. But, you know, when big games come, those guys, you know, usually step up pretty well. So interested to kind of see how it goes and, you know, the poise and the maturity level, I think now going into tournament play is going to be big for this team. You know, they've got a lot of older guys, guys that have been around. We always talk about it. Besides Elliott, guys that have been in college for a little bit of time. And when it comes to tournament time, there's going to be all of these ebbs and flows. A team might go on an 8-0 run against you, and you have to take a timeout and figure out, hey, what are we going to do to stop this run? Or you might go on an 8-0 run, 10-0 run, go up by 10 or 12, and a team comes back out, and they go on their own 6-0 run. You know, so it's it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, the maturity level has to be there and you have to be poised and, you know, as uh, cool, calm and collected as you possibly can be as the tournament play goes on. So, and I think these guys, I think these guys have shown that they've, they've got some of those, you know, they've got some of those guys that are able to do that. Um, and so I think, I think another thing, man, that I want to hit on is, and it seems real little and, uh, you know, a lot of fans and things like that, they probably just see it as, you know, it's kind of fun and jokes and guys dancing and celebrating and things like that. But one thing that I love to see is the fact that when something good happens with this team, a lot of times you see at least two or three other guys joining in, celebrating somebody's success or, you know, celebrating an and one or whatever it might be. And I think going down the stretch, that was one thing that you know, my teams were always so lucky to have and blessed to have was guys who, when it came down to winning, there was really nothing else that really mattered. And whether it was you have scored two points or you've had 30, if the next guy next to you gets an and one or there's a big momentum play or a charge or something like that, everybody was over there celebrating and everybody was, you know, excited and, and really got going. And I think when you, you see this team, especially – you know, one play that sticks out is one. I think RJ had an and one three in the second half yesterday. And uh, immediately, I think it was Harrison was over there. Uh, Seth was over there, I think. Mondo might have been over there. Um, and so it's just, it's good to see that. And it's good to have that going into tournament play, you know, because there's going to be times where you're going to have to just band together as a team. You know, sometimes people say, you know, it's, it's us against. You know, a lot of people say it's us against the world or whatever, but it's a mindset of, hey, look, we're all that matters. These however many guys, 15 guys on this team and the five guys that are on the court at, the, at a certain time, we're all that matter. It doesn't even necessarily matter what, you know, what plays are being called. It doesn't matter what the other team is running. Like we're the ones that control where we go. And I think that's a good sign to see, especially going into this time of the season, um, to kind of see them gelling at this time, I think that's that's going to be huge for them. Yeah, absolutely. And you can even give specific examples, so like someone like Paxton as well, who, you know, he came to UNC, he played so much the last two years. Now it was at Brown, of course, and he had to know that he was coming into an ACC environment where his minutes would be cut. But still, he's remained engaged the entire season. I mean, even just the fact that both he and Cormac didn't get to start last night, they were seniors, um, but the walk-ons got to start. Um, and they kind of accepted that role and, you know, got to still get their send off. They got to, you know, leave to a standing ovation, things like that. But I think that sort of permeates up and down the roster. You could see in the pregame ceremony uh, when the guys were raising up their uh, jerseys is sort of the senior day ceremony. Everyone was so excited for each other. Um, and you need that, especially going into March. Because, um, you know, another thing, and Justin, you know this as well as anyone, when it gets into March for college basketball, the team is around each other a lot. There's a lot of time together in Washington, D.C., where the ACC tournament is, <laughs> uh, a lot of open practices and, you know, time on the road together in March. So if you have that team, Kevin.
Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, – I mean, people don't realize how much time you do spend with each other, especially on the road, um, and especially come tournament time. You know, for instance, with the ACC tournament, you're gone for basically a week. And so, you know, if it's – if you have study hall, you're in there together doing it. If you have tutoring, you're in there doing it together. Uh, meals, every meal you do, unless you, like, go with your family or something like that that's in town, you're there as a team. Team meetings, you're there all the time. Um, and then you room with another teammate. So you're literally with these people 24 seven. There's no, there's no breakaway. There's, there's no like, Hey, I'm gonna go do my own thing. Like, no, you're in there. And so having a group that gets along really well, um, and enjoys being around each other, uh, is huge. You know, I think people miss the off the court and how it affects on the court situations. You know, if it's, if I don't, If I don't really like being around somebody, then let's say we go into a game and that player messes up. More than likely, my reaction is going to be totally different as opposed to if I'm really close to him, I really rock with that player. That situation is going to be way more encouraging and way more like, hey, come on, next play, whatever, as opposed to like annoyed and angry and those little things. So off the court, gelling is just as important as on the court. A lot of times off the court is what kind of gets the on the court gelling to start to happen. And, you know, I think that's what you've kind of seen this team, even though it's such a new team with each other and so many new pieces from the start of the season. uh, I think that's kind of what you've seen is the guys have, you know, begin to buy into, hey, this, we're in this together. And, you know, let alone that once the NCAA tournament time starts, And yeah, you're only gone for, you know, a couple days at a time, necessarily a weekend or, you know, Thursday through Sunday type situation. But for that, you're doing media, you're doing open practices, you're doing, um, you're doing all the same stuff that I was talking about as far as team meetings, team meals, all that kind of stuff. There's way more media coverage of the NCAA tournament. So, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, being in the right place as a team on and off the floor is probably one of the most important things at this point in the season. Um, and I'm seeing signs that it's, that they're in the right place going forward. So, you know, hopefully I hope that they can continue doing that. And like we talked, we've talked about it before a couple of times. There's not many guys on this team that have really won at a high level. You know, you have RJ and Mondo who made it to championship game two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. Um, but then they come back this year or this past year and don't make the tournament. And now they come onto a team that's top 10 and really has high hopes and things like that. So, you know, uh, I'm very interested and excited to see how bought in these guys are. You know, I think that's that's a big thing. So, you know, I think it would be interesting to see. You know, thankfully, I think having a Duke game right before tournament play starts – I think it's actually a perfect game to have going into kind of what tournament play looks like as far as intensity level, the environments, um, things like that. So looking forward to this Duke, this Duke game, man, you know, we talked about the last game uh, that they played against Duke. The biggest thing for me was the matchups and How do they match up? How do the guards match up with each other? How do the freshmen match up with each other? How do the bigs match up with each other? And I think when you, when you, when you look at the game, I think obviously McCain had a really good game for them. McCain and Roach had good games. Um, And Filipowski put up some numbers offensively, but I think this, that the last Duke game, Mondo really put his stamp on that game. And he showed that there was really nobody that could guard him when he really set his mind to being aggressive. Um, and I think he really set the tone for this team, you know? So I think going into this game, I think it's the same situation. I think they're going to maybe make some, make some changes as far as maybe doubling Mondo a little bit earlier or a little bit more. Um, but then Harrison, this was one of the games where, like we talked about before, he really stepped up in a big game when it comes to shooting five for nine from three you know, finish with 21 and 13. Um, And so, you know, I think the same mentality going into this game, I think it is a little bit different going into Cameron as opposed to playing at the Dean Dome. 
Cam, there's just a different, um, it's a different energy to it. The court is way smaller. The the not necessarily the court, but the arena itself is way smaller than the Dean Dome. Uh, fans are right on top of you. Those fans are there's a reason they call them camera crazies because uh, their energy level is out of the roof. And uh, you know, I think having the same mindset going into that game and maybe knowing you're going to have to play a little bit harder because they're going to have the home crowd on their side. Uh, but I think this team is. I think this team matches up with this Duke team very well and can really make some make some problems for them uh, in this game coming up. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about tournament time, ACC tournament, NCAA tournament. This is a big game, though, on Saturday. This is a humongous game uh, to have the opportunity to go and win an outright ACC title um, is a big opportunity for UNC. Um, I was talking to uh, Duke insider Tyler. He was kind of filling me in on some things because they've been playing really well since the last UNC game. They're 8-1, and one, um, and there were a few things that he called out. I think, number one, the way that Proctor, their guard, is playing over the last few weeks. He has 28 assists to just 10 turnovers in his last seven games, um, and that includes a three-turnover performance in his last game. So he's been really strong. Uh, and then two role players as well. We've talked a lot about matchups, but it matters for the role players as well. Uh, Sean Stewart and TJ Power, I think, could have a big impact in this game, uh, Stewart has really found his role. He played really well in Duke's last game. Uh, he's kind of taken some of Ryan Young's minutes a little bit. And then Power is a is a shooter. I could see him coming in and impacting this game with his shooting. Uh, that's another point I wanted to get in about the the first matchup. Uh, you know, they talk about you know it's a make or miss league in the NBA. It felt a little bit like a, kind of a make or miss game for Duke in the first one. They went five of nineteen. On threes, uh, 26%. Keep an eye on that number on Saturday night. UNC has to defend the three-point line very well because this is still a very good shooting team for Duke. I mean, it feels like every shot McCain takes right now these last few games is going (laughs) in. He's just a really talented shooter. Uh, So keep an eye on defending the three-point line on Saturday. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think uh, really it was – I feel like it was this game and – you know, from that game, from the last North Carolina Duke game until now, McCain has been lights out. You know, I know. I think wasn't the, I think the Florida State game that he had some crazy amount of threes, like seven threes or something like that. I think was after this North Carolina Duke game. Um, but to your point, I mean, Duke has played way better here recently than they were playing before. And you know, I think when you look at the box score from the last game, something for me that's kind of tell telling and shows me that North Carolina defended pretty decently, even though it was a high scoring game, you know, North Carolina had 19 assists. Duke only had not or eight. And so obviously that means basically defensively you're, you're forcing them into a lot of isolation situations. You're forcing them into a lot of, you know, no pass shots, uh, just forcing them into a lot of tougher shots as opposed to maybe you're getting guys into rotations and, you're able to kick out, drive, kick, and get way better looks than what you would if you, you know, aren't really moving the ball that much and just doing isolation situations. Um, and then you look at the turnovers. I mean, North Carolina took care of the ball. They only had five turnovers, and Duke had 11, which isn't a lot. But, you know, out of those 11 turnovers, nine of them were steals for North Carolina. So, you know, I think those numbers, you know, even though you know it doesn't seem like those would be huge numbers, um, those are kind of telling for me because that kind of shows what was done on the defensive end. And, you know, outside of this game, North Carolina has done the same thing defensively kind of game in and game out, except for a few outliers. But, you know, going into a game like this, you have to have that same mentality of we're going to make everything difficult. We're going to make all their shots contested. We're going to run people off the line. If we're going to run McCain off the line because of how he's shooting or, Roach because of how he, you know, how good of a player he is. Um, And we're going to match the energy of guys like Stewart and Mitchell and, you know, guys like that, that really come in and kind of affect the game from that, that standpoint. So, you know, I think it's going to be a way better, a way better game on Saturday. Uh, I think there's a two really hot teams. I think Duke is really, really hot right now. Like you said, eight and one in the last nine. Um, And then North Carolina has been pretty consistent throughout you know, throughout the season, but they seem to be playing 
their best brand of basketball kind of going down this stretch. So should be fun, man. I mean, what better what better time to have these two teams playing at their best than the last North Carolina Duke game before tournament play starts? I mean, there's really not there's not much better of a situation. So um, you know, I know these guys are gonna get I know these guys are gonna get fired up. Uh, I know fans obviously are gonna get fired up um, and kind of you know make what this rivalry is you know, once again, and, uh, you know, should be a lot of fun. We'll, we'll see what happens, man. Yeah, absolutely. I think, too, the energy is going to be in Duke's favor in the stadium on Saturday. That was such a big part of the first matchup. It felt like UNC was out hustling. They were using the home court advantage uh, to their advantage, and UNC finished the season with a 14-1 and home record. So they had a true home court advantage this season in the Smith Center. It'll be interesting to see how they respond in Cameron. <laughs> Justin, with the little time we left have left here, I'm curious, do you have any memories? Can you remember anything any of the Cameron crazies said to you? Just any perspective on playing in Cameron Indoor Stadium for us? You know what? I um it's funny because I was just on I was just on Theo's podcast and we were talking about North Carolina and Duke and the rivalry and you know, NC State, NC State fans for some reason are going absolutely crazy on me and Theo right now because we said that we basically dislike them more than we dislike Duke. And, uh, you know, I think a big part of that, I really can't remember a situation where the Duke fans said anything crazy to me. I can't remember a situation where it was like that. Now, NC State, they said some things that probably shouldn't be said to other human beings. And uh, so I think, I think right, whenever. That's not funny. That's not you know, funny, but it's a little when, funny. <laughs> when, when things, when, when situations like that happen, I think is what really creates uh, a dislike and a distaste for another school. And I think, you know, once again, I'll double down on kind of what me and Theo were saying. I think that's why there's more of a dislike towards NC State is because of how they talk and how they treat people when they, you know, when these games happen. Uh, but with Duke, man, like there's a certain respect level between Duke and North Carolina. You know, obviously fans, they can make it, you know, oh, we hate Duke, we hate North Carolina, you know, all, you know, that kind of rivalry, uh, you know, all those things that come with that rivalry. But there's a certain respect level that I think makes this rivalry so good. You know, if we didn't respect Duke each and every time we went and played them, then the rivalry wouldn't be as intense. The environment wouldn't be as intense. It would feel like just another game all over again. And so I think that respect level is kind of what makes this rivalry what it really is. And, you know, obviously they've got an unbelievable home court advantage as well, just like we do at the Dean Dome. You know, anytime you take the ball out of the sidelines, all you feel is – you know, the, the students and everybody, you know, doing the spirit fingers or whatever they call that, you know, as you're trying to pass the ball in and, you know, anytime you, you know, do anything, you hear about it. And so, you know, I think that's what is so cool is both environments, whether it's at UNC or at Duke, it just creates such an energy that it just fires anybody up. There's a reason why come Saturday, there's going to be a lot of people that set alarms and make sure they're back at home for this North Carolina Duke game even if they have no connection to it, it's just, it's the best rivalry in sports. Um, and so, you know, that kind of encompasses the environment, the teams, the coaches. I mean, Coach Williams and Coach K just had the their little special come out on ESPN uh, that basically should have shown the world that, like, they were really good friends. It wasn't even like they were just enemies at all times. You know, obviously when the game days come and it's time to go against each other, like, we're not trying to lose. Like, we want to win with our team. and you know, do that as best as we can. But when it comes to just as people and things like that, like they were great friends. So if the two head coaches, arguably two of the best of all time, could say that they were actually friends during this rivalry and going into these games and things like that, I think it just creates an environment of, you know, hey, we respect the other side, so we're going to go out there and give everything we possibly can. Uh, to try to win this game. So, you know, obviously it's it's two new head coaches um, and, you know, new coaching staffs. And this is, I guess this is my man MP's first uh, 
first North Carolina Duke game at Duke as a as a coach. So it's uh it should be electric, man. It'll be two top ten teams that are going at it, uh, probably going at it for a higher seed come you know come tournament selection time and things like that. So there's there's a lot on the line and it's uh it should be pretty heated, man. So it should be a fun environment. It should be fun to see and you know hopefully North Carolina is up to it. Yeah, I just so happened to watch that uh, interview, Roy Williams and, and Coach K today, and I totally agree with you. It was all about respect and mutual admiration, um, respect between the two coaches, between the pr- two programs. It, it made the rivalry even better. Uh, Justin, my last stat of the day, this is bad news for you, unfortunately. <laughs> R.J. Davis had his 19th 20-point game this season, the most by a Tar Heel since you did it. You had 19 in the 2016-17 season, so I'm sorry to break the news. Another one of your records, it looks like, is is on the way out, or another one of your stats, maybe. Any final closing thoughts from you today before the UNC Duke game on Saturday? Uh, I mean, I, I first, let me just say, you know, everything that RJ is doing, he deserves it, and it's, uh, you know, I, I am – more than happy to say that RJ is is breaking all my records. Heck, I think he needs like ten more to break the threes in a season, or something like that. Which, you know, obviously, Lord willing, if they play a few more games than you know the minimum that they could play going forward, I can see that being broken very easily. So, you know, records are meant to be broken, and uh, you know, it was fun while it lasted, lasted seven years, and you know, obviously, RJ's come out and done some things that no. You know, North Carolina player has done in a long time, if ever. So, um, shout out to him for sure for what an unbelievable season he's having. Um, but to kind of close this out, man, it's uh, once again, it's you know, the season's coming to a close, and I think each and every week, what we've kind of tried to do is take it game by game, um, take it situation by situation, while also just supporting this team and. I think they've shown that they've earned our support. They've earned our trust going down the stretch. And uh, I'm excited for them. You know, it's 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 definitely a fun fun time of the year. This is the best time. You're gonna, you know, these guys are going to create some of the best memories that they'll ever have in their entire life going down this stretch. So, you know, for me, to the players, take advantage of it. Enjoy every moment, moment of it. As fans, you know, obviously coming off a year where we didn't make the tournament, as fans, we need to enjoy it as much as we possibly can too. You just don't ever really know when, you know, when a good team might come through. When it, you know it might be a down year, whatever. And this is a really good team that has a chance to really make a, a deep run. So, you know, obviously, just continue to support these guys. Once again, to everybody that listens and watches, we appreciate uh, checking in. And you know, for however long you might listen or watch, we we appreciate you and we love you for you know just kind of coming in and. You know, tuning in to shooting it straight. So, until next time, hopefully we uh, hopefully we have a big Duke game, and you know we can kind of talk about that a little bit.